Welcome to the Real Health Podcast, where we help you achieve the best and strongest version of yourself. Be sure to follow us online on Instagram, Twitter, like us on Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. You are listening to the Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick, Episode 5, Protein. All right, welcome to the Real Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Taylor Crick, coming to you today talking about protein, the third macronutrient that we're talking about. Remember, beginning, we were talking about sugar and turning your body, changing it from a sugar burner, teaching it and training it how to become a fat burner. So last time we talked about fats and how to increase the good fats and decrease the bad fats so that you actually encourage your body to be a fat burner so that it stops burning sugar and storing fat and it starts burning that fat off your body. So turning your body into a fat burning machine. And this week we're going to be talking about the third macronutrient, protein. So that's the other source for calories for your body. And so we talked about how fat is the most efficient source. So you actually get over twice as many calories per gram from fat that you get from sugar or protein. You get nine calories per gram of fat from fat, but from sugar and from protein, you only get about four, or you get four calories per gram. So uh, protein is a source of fuel for our body, but it's not the most efficient source. Fat is the most efficient source of fuel. But what you do need protein for, it is essential for every single function in your body. So first off, you know, just a little background of protein and what is protein, because we hear that a lot, and you know, what we tend to think of, we tend to think of, you know, protein shakes, we tend to think of meatheads, or people, you know, uh, just eating pure red meat, you know, steak for lunch, steak for breakfast, steak for dinner, um, bacon every meal, you know, and we think of getting our protein there, but that's, you know, a big misconception, and just like how we talked about how, you know, the biggest misconception is that fat makes you fat, dietary fat makes you fat, another big misconception is that you know the only way to get a lot of protein is from eating a lot of meat products and then, and I see a lot of patients in my office that think that you know they just need a lot of protein so even you know women trying to lose weight they're thinking oh I'm trying I need to get my protein I need to get my protein and you know there are different dietary plans for losing weight for gaining weight for bodybuilding where you're really breaking down and looking at your macronutrients you know you need so many grams of carbs you need so many grams of protein you need so many grams of fat But that is not what we encourage. You know, I don't encourage calorie counting. I encourage eating a healthy diet, a healthy balanced diet, and stopping when you're full and starting when you're hungry. So there are ways that you can you can monitor and measure the grams of protein, but you don't have to. But a lot of times we're overeating our protein. So what is protein? Proteins are the building blocks of life. So biochemically speaking, proteins break down into really, really small small things that build together to form every single tissue in your body. Uh, So they're necessary for every function, including the growth of cells, tissue repair, and regeneration. And so when we talk about, you know, the fact that if you've got a bad heart, well, your heart will regenerate. You know, in a year from now, every cell in your heart will be a brand new cell than what it is today. So the proteins are the building blocks in what your body's using to build that. So you're getting that from your food uh, and they're responsible for, you know, a lot of different various functions, you know, even for your enzymes to work, for your hormones to work, you need proteins. There are storage proteins, there are transport proteins, there are structural proteins, there are protection proteins, there are are even contractile proteins, you know, which is what we think about a lot are the, the contractile proteins in our muscles. And that's, you know, probably the best example is, you know, think about your bicep contracting. The things that are doing the contract uh, you know, you're sent an electrical signal from the brain via the spinal cord out through the nerves, and it tells these proteins to contract. And so that's not only in your bicep and your quads and your big muscles, that's in your heart. So every single second of every single day, those are contracting. So your proteins are absolutely necessary. Another just little background uh, on, on, you know, the wordage and the verbiage, you know, with proteins that you may see pretty often is, you know, amino acids. And so what amino acids are, those are actually the building blocks to your proteins. And so there's 22 standard amino acids. And of those 22, there are nine that are called essential. And they're essential because your body can't produce them. You have to get them from your diet. So if you see 
you know, something that contains all the essential amino acids, that means it contains the ones that you need uh, from your diet that your body can't produce. The 22 amino acids, you may see different things that will say complete versus incomplete protein. So a complete protein, what that means is that it has all 22 standard amino acids. And so some of the examples of a complete protein, most of your animal products are complete protein. So your meat, you know, your grass-fed beef, your lean, your organic free-range chicken, your eggs, uh, all going to be complete proteins. Some of your legumes like chickpeas or gar garbanzo beans, so your hummus, uh, black beans, uh, and then there's also some other plant-based complete proteins like quinoa. You'll hear a lot about quinoa today being a complete protein because you get all 22 of your amino acids from quinoa. Another one is hemp seeds. So, you know, those are a food that a vegetarian is going to have a lot of in their diet because what, they're, what they can be short of if they're not careful is they can be short of some of these amino acids. But a lot of times what we think is, you know, how many grams of protein do I eat? Well, all of them, you know, and, and especially men, that's what we think if we're an athlete, if we want to get big, if we want to get strong, it's just protein, protein, protein. But the fact is, is that excess protein turns to sugar in your body. And we all know what sugar turns into our body is exactly what we don't want is fat storage. So there is a chance that you are eating too much protein. Um, you need to take a look at that. You know, it's specific for each and every person, but following a meal plan, following some kind of guidelines or knowing, you know, what your sources of protein are, are going to help. So that's what we want to talk about right now are some of the sources of where you can get good protein. And the first source and the best source is our animal product. So if we're following a maximized living nutrition plan, a paleo type diet, we are, you know, not vegetarian, not vegan. We are eating plenty of animal products and getting good fat from them. But remember, the one thing about your animal products that is so important is it has to be organic. It has to be clean because remember we talked about the food chain and the animals are at the top of the food chain, right? The only thing that's above most animals is, is us, you know, when we're talking about, you know, a cow or a chicken. Uh, the, at the top of the food chain, and we talked about toxic bioaccumulation. So if you're, you are what you eat, well, then that food, you know, that cow is what it ate. And then that, you know, grain that it ate is what it ate. And, you know, what, you continue going down the line, you are what you eat, and you are what they ate, and you are what they ate. So you have to change your meat products first because they're the most toxic. And with, when we talked about fats, that was the most important thing when we looked at our meat products, especially our red meat is the skewed fat ratio, the incredibly high amount of inflammatory omega-6s and the incredibly low amount and ratio of anti-inflammatory omega-3s. So we want to switch out our meat products first. That's going with grass-fed beef, grass-fed steak. Any of your red meat products should be grass-fed right away. The second best is organic. They should at the very, very least be organic, but they ideally should be grass-fed. The other thing is when you're looking at chicken, it should definitely be organic. It should be hormone-free. It should be antibiotic-free. It should be free range, so that's foraging out, you know, in the pasture, eating grass, eating bugs. Free range, that's what you want from your chicken. That's going to be your cleanest source of protein. The other one is your wild-caught fish. So things like salmon, you know, some of the best fish sources, because when we talk about the toxic bioaccumulation, we're looking at the size of the fish. So some of the big fish like tuna, we want to cut out because they're a toxic source of protein. We want to look into some of the smaller fish like anchovies, like sardines. Some of the best choices too, you know, I had a patient just this week say that she had some trout over the weekend. Great choice. Stream caught trout. Another good source, wild caught salmon. So cold water, wild caught Pacific Coast salmon, really, really good choice of protein. And when you actually look at, you know, how many grams of protein you're getting per serving, the highest ones are going to be your red meat, your grass-fed meat, and your salmon, even more so than chicken, just a little bit more, you know, about five more grams per serving that you're getting from those. The last one when you're talking about animal products is your natural source dairy. Now, I'm not big on dairy. I don't do any milk. If you are going to do dairy, do it raw. That's going to be your best source of protein. Uh, but one of the dangerous things when you look at dairy is the protein casein. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But your, your natural source dairy can be a good source of protein. So raw milk, 
raw cheese or as close to raw as you can get. You don't want to be doing skim milk. You don't even want to be doing 1%, 2%. Whole milk, uh, raw is best. Raw cheese is readily accessible, especially here in Utah. And there's also some good choices for raw milk. Those are going to be your best sources for protein. And a lot of people, you know, we know those sources. Uh, some of the other ones, you know, some of the ancient grains like we talked about, like quinoa are good choices. Some things like beans definitely have protein. You know, when we talked about protein being the building block for all life, any food you, have, you eat is going to have some protein in it. So you're getting protein from everything. But remember, if you are vegetarian, if you are vegan, you're going to have to eat a lot more of the high-protein foods like quinoa, like even some other ancient grains like amaranth or buckwheat. Uh, you're going to have to eat a lot more of those to get your protein content than you would if you're eating animal products. So that's the best sources right there. Another source of protein superfood, really, that I love to, to spend a couple minutes on is Eggs. Eggs are a great source. And actually, the, the highest protein content is actually in the egg white, but you don't want to cut out the yolk. So when we're talking about protein, the majority of it comes from the white, but the yolk is where a lot of the nutritional value comes from. A lot of the vitamins, a lot of the nutrients, a lot of even the cholesterol, which you know we busted the myth that cholesterol is bad for you. This could actually help lower your bad cholesterol and raise your good cholesterol coming from the yolk of the egg. So you don't want to separate them. But a couple things, you know, because when you go, when we do a shop with the doc event at a grocery store or you're at the grocery store and you're looking at eggs, you know, it can be like alphabet soup. You know, the omega-3 kind, there's grade A, there's double A, there's triple A, there's organic, there's free range, there's cage free. So what is the difference and how do I know? So the first thing is there are some databases online that have indexed this. They've gone through different brands thousands of different brands of eggs and indexed how healthy they truly are. So you can find a lot of information about this online. But some general rules of thumb, you know, you want to start with your organic. When we talk about good, better, and best, organic, just like with our chicken, is an absolute must. Because once again, this is an animal product. We have to have organic. Now, above that, I do not recommend going for the omega-3 eggs. So you'll see that that's really popular today because everybody knows that that's a buzzword. And like we talked about with our fats podcast, go back and listen to that about why that's such a buzzword. But omega-3 eggs actually aren't that high in omega-3s. They're not as high as a cage-free natural foraging egg. They've actually measured the omega-3 content and found that the highest omega-3 content actually comes from the chickens that are cage-free Free range is what you want to actually look for. So cage free is the second best. Free range is the best. That means that these eggs are foraging. They're eating insects. They're eating bugs. They're eating grass. And another thing that you can look at, so don't go for the omega-3 egg. Don't even go for the cage free egg. Go for the free range organic. That is the best of the best. An even better option would be to get it from a local farmer. But if you're at Sprouts, you're at Smith's, you're at Kroger, you're at a grocery store, anywhere across the country, you should be able to find a good option for a cage-free egg. Another thing that you can look at is when you open that egg up, there will be a difference in the color of the yolk. And so what I'd encourage everybody to do is if you're curious about this, you know, start looking at your eggs definitely, but also just go to Google and Google image this. You can actually Google image this and see, you know, there's a whole rainbow spectrum from dark orange to a really light yellow. And what you want to look for in a good healthy egg yolk is a good dark orange color. So you can compare these and look, and they're actually a better flavor, a stronger flavor, but that's an indication that you're getting more nutritional value from the egg. And we'll talk about eggs more in some future episodes because uh, eggs are tricky. You know, one thing with eggs, you do not want to overcook them. That can actually oxidize the cholesterol, make them worse for you. So I actually recently just started doing more raw egg options and doing a lot more over easy. That's my most most common way to consume eggs is over easy and not because it's my favorite because I'll be honest with you it's not my favorite is an omelet throw some spinach some peppers you know add some veggies in there that's awesome but I've been doing more over easy because it's more healthy it's less cooked it's less oxidized and you get more of the nutritional value from eggs 
So as you start switching your egg choices over, then you'll get more advanced in your egg preparation. A good source for this too is looking at Dr. Mercola's website. So Dr. Mercola is the, the number one natural health newsletter and website in the world, uh, but great choices. You know, his food, food plan is exactly like Maximize Living's, but it goes through beginner, intermediate, and advanced and the different things that you should be looking for in each stage. So looking at your egg choices, then looking at the way that you prepare the eggs, then in the advanced stage, it's going for more raw egg choices. So that is a good superfood. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about is you know uh, how there are good proteins versus bad proteins, and how can a protein you know be good versus bad? And there are more toxic proteins, some proteins that are more toxic for us. But in particular, what I want to touch on are the ones that you hear about the most often. And, and you know, a lot of people aren't even aware that these are proteins, but how about going gluten-free? That is a protein. Gluten is a protein. So going gluten-free, you're actually eliminating a protein from your body. And so, you know, why is gluten good for some people or bad for others? Or why were we able to take in gluten no problem hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago even? Because if you think back, you know, gluten comes from wheat, it comes from rye, and it comes from barley. And if you look back, you know, as far back as the Bible, the Old Testament, that's what they were eating, you know. And so there's, you know, these foods have been around for thousands of years. Why are we reacting so poorly to them now? Well, the reason is because of a leaky gut. And that's why different proteins can have a different effect on our bodies, cause things like allergies, cause things like acne, even eczema, psoriasis, so skin conditions can be caused by leaky gut and by proteins. Uh, other things even like, um, you know, mental things like anxiety, ADHD, autism, depression can be caused by a leaky gut. And this is a big, big topic that we're going to get into in detail about a leaky gut and the importance of your gut health. But that's really how a good protein can go bad. And so using the example of gluten or the other example being casein, and you hear the most about these two proteins in the autistic community with autistic mothers uh, because they've tried the gluten-free, casein-free diet and seen how well their kids have responded to it. And then, you know, if you know anything about the autistic community, it's very well connected. There are you know, for, uh, forums and message boards and moms sharing testimonials with moms. And if you get on any of these message boards, they will, you'll find a lot of information about the gluten-free, casein-free diet. Because a lot of our kids on the autistic spectrum have a leaky gut. And you can actually test for this. You know, there's a test that you can do for intestinal permeability permeability to find out if you have a leaky gut. In our office, I believe it's $120, but that should be about you know what you find in the community between $100 and $200 to test if you have a leaky gut. But if there's some red flags that you can know whether or not you have some of the warning signs. So some of them are like allergies. Allergies, that's a, an immune response. Acne, so skin conditions. You know, we can put all the products, potions, and lotions onto the outside of our skin that we want, but good health comes from the inside out. And it starts with the spine because the spine controls everything else. But then the next thing that I like to look at is look at the gut. And so when we look at a skin condition, that's exactly what we look at is first we look at the spine, then we look at the gut, and we'll see things like eczema and psoriasis clear up. And there are certain dietary things that people have found that immediately when they eat them, they're going to flare up. Like I had a patient in yesterday, she said, I ate corn over the weekend and now I have this rash all over the outside of my skin. So there are certain foods that can, you know, exacerbate these leaky gut symptoms and cause a reaction. Uh, and another couple things that, you know, leaky gut or even gluten in particular can cause, you know, this is from a review in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most prestigious medical journals, showing that gluten has been linked to over 55 diseases, including osteoporosis, cancer, irritable bowel disease, inflammatory bowel disease, neurological things like anxiety, dementia, autism, ADHD, schizophrenia, and one of the worst today that I hate to see the most are the autoimmune conditions. Celiac disease, so that's gluten, gluten uh, sensitivity, gluten allergy, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, lupus, 
thyroid diseases. Gluten is absolutely devastating to the thyroid, and thyroid conditions are affecting millions and millions of Americans today. They're throwing our hormones out of whack, affecting our weight gain, weight loss, energy levels. All the chronic conditions that are affecting Americans can be caused by gluten. And the reason why is because of the leaky gut. So when people ask me, you know, is gluten free for me? Should I go gluten free? There are several things that you can look at to determine whether or not you need to go gluten free. But the majority of us, we're not, or actually all of us, we're not going to go cause any problems by going gluten free. So you're not going to go wrong by going gluten free. So everybody can experiment with gluten free and do it. Here's the one mistake that I want to warn you against: is I want to warn you against going gluten free and eating a lot of grains that don't have gluten in them. Your best bet is to go grain free completely. So if you're going grain free completely. You're eliminating gluten because gluten is found in grains. But what a, the mistake that I see a lot of people make is they'll still eat gluten-free bread. They'll still eat rice. They'll still eat gluten-free pasta. They'll still eat gluten-free pizza. And they're still eating inflammatory grains. Might not be gluten. Might not be the exact same response, but can still cause problems in your body. So that's one of the ways that proteins, a good protein, can go bad. The last thing that I want to touch on is one of the best sources for protein that we haven't talked about and that's whey protein because when you talk about casein you know there are certain researchers that believe that casein is the number one dietary link to cancer uh, worldwide so that's a protein that comes from dairy that comes from cows uh, and it's casein uh, so you'll read about different things that casein causes but one of the worst is obviously is cancer um, but at the same time you know there are certain vegan or vegetarian uh, pro promoters that will say to eliminate all animal proteins but just in the same that there's research that shows that casein can cause cancer there is research that shows that whey protein can actually decrease cancer by stimulating your body's master detoxifier your body's master antioxidant glutathione so whey protein is actually the most bioavailable source of protein out there more than casein more than soy protein more than anything which means that it's the most biologically available that your body can use it the most efficiently so whey protein is a really really good option for a good clean protein source what you want to look at though is the quality of your whey so just like we're looking at the quality of our meat we want to look at the quality of our whey because it is an animal product. And if you just go grab any whey off the shelf at Walmart or Costco or GNC, chances are you're not getting a good whey, just like if you're going to grab any meat off those shelves too. You want to get the good one so that you're getting the full benefit. And what a typical commercial whey protein will have is its high heat process, which denatures the proteins. It also comes from grain-fed cows. They also use a lot of whey isolates uh, that aren't as healthy as the concentrates. They have pesticides and GMOs, hormones, uh, antibiotics in used with their cattle. They have artificial sweeteners, and they have no live probiotics. And so the difference with a maximized living perfect protein, which I drink every single day, you can buy in our office, you can find on our website, you can go to alignfamilychiropractic.com, it will link you to our store, and you can find the perfect protein, but it's from, it's from grass-fed cows, 100% grass-fed cows, they're non-denatured proteins, it's naturally raised, it's naturally sweetened with stevia, and it has natural enzymes and live probiotics so it's actually a more usable source of protein but once again you know just to recap when you're looking at your sources of proteins whether it's whey whether it's salmon whether it's chicken even whether it's quinoa or from grains or from vegetables you want to look at the clean sources you don't want to have farm raised fish you don't want to have conventionally raised chicken with hormones and antibiotics you don't want to have conventionally raised meat either with skewed fat ratios or high omega-6s low omega-3s you want to look for the good sources of clean protein and if you're doing that then you're taking a step in the right direction and if you're doing that also it's going to help you with your sugar sources 
with your fat sources. So all three of these work together with the fourth one, toxins. If you're avoiding toxins, you're doing these four action steps of a total food makeover. You're radically transforming your risk of disease and your chance for maximizing your body's ability to be healthy. So keep it up. Keep up the good work. We'll talk to you next time when we talk about toxins. Make sure that you go back to the old podcast. You listen in re-listen to them, learn how you can decrease your sugars, how you can increase your good fats, and keep your body going as a fat burner and a muscle builder. Thank you for listening to The Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com.